Okay. An educated person should be willing to talk to people, however they label themselves politically. Right. Because it's more important to cut through authoritarianism and corruption of whatever power you have in whatever it you know ideology for whatever reasons you give yourself this power a liberally educated person like socrates he doesn't care if you're blah blah or blah blah he talked to anybody and then he said well what do you know that gives you legitimacy for having the authority you have the public trusts you to do this and that well what how is it that you're worthy of that trust? What do you know? How do you use this power? That's transparency. Yeah. And that's what authoritarianism on either side doesn't allow for transparency, yeah. right? And then because there's no transparency, there's no accountability, right? Then, you know, you have to know what power do you have? And then the next question is, why is it that you're a legitimate leader? That would be accountability. Yeah. And those are very important cornerstones of liberal education. And everyone should be able to question everyone else, no matter what labels they go on, no matter what they think they are. Everyone should be uh, transparent and accountable. Plus, you must be transparent with yourself, am I deluded about who I am? Or am I, do I really know myself? Am I deluded about how righteous I am? <laughs> yeah. right? Am I, have I made myself into a brand instead of a person, right? It's intuitively kind of obvious. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a very long answer, but is that- no. Yeah, that helps. It helps. Um, the reading, and it, it actually makes more sense now because I kept finding myself thinking about my management experiences and how it was so important for me to try and foster a good work culture. And I mean, because I've been employed at enough different places that I could see a difference between working where the employees matter and there's a dialogue between the levels um, and working in a place where there's no communication, there's no consideration. It's just come and get this done because this is what the company needs. And the, uh, the, the reading about fascism actually reminded me a lot about the research I've been doing on the cognitive behavioral therapy and the stoicism and stuff. And there's a lot of good ideas in the reading, but what worries me is that it will get put off as, or put forward as mind over matter, which yes. is not really the way that it works, you know? And I mean, in a way, yes, being proactive helps, but when I say being proactive, that means every day you consciously make decisions to combat what difficulties you have. You know, it doesn't mean just think about different things and you'll be fine. You know, so sure. yeah. You want actually integrity, right? Yes. You want to integrate your desires, your thoughts, and your actions. Yeah. So people are. The so baby opened my door, so I'm having trouble here. And I, I got to get up and close my door. <laughs> okay. So, Ivy, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I, we're talking about the one that was, we're talking about the one that was due for reading for today, right? Actually, it was just on there. She, we didn't get finished with fascism, right? So, she started out with the article about Christian fascists. But we also had the article on trauma. Okay. Uh, I think I was reading over Illusion of Happiness and Body Keeps the Score. The Body Keeps the Score. That's good. 
that was for today. Uh, and Sarah, least, would... It's fine. Don't apologize. You're fine. Um, did you did you think we got you know did you talk enough about the article on Christian fascists? I think I talked as I recall I talked so much last time that we didn't really get to it and I think we were going to start today with that but if you are prepared for the other one no problem. Okay, I think maybe I looked over that article. Let me go check with it. Sorry. It's okay, Ivy, because it is really nice the way they come together. I think. Um so even if you aren't up on the Christian fascist one, just by reading the first few pages of the body keeps the score, what it talks about when it talks about what people need and all that stuff, it's really relevant. Yeah, um, to me what it was saying that I saw what she was saying when she was talking about, it's about body, what is it, mind over matter? in the yeah. uh, pages saying something about how we're taught to just think about the positive sides, you know, no matter how bad it gets, you know, just keep your thoughts positive. I think it a lot, it takes a lot more than just keeping your thoughts positive. Yeah, it takes, we need reassurance and um, it spoke a lot about human connection. And I feel like that's, again, you know, one of the big things why religion works is because we need something greater than ourselves we need community we need like companionship if that um makes sense and that's really what i was getting uh from the reading uh let's see oh yeah i, I think, think I mean, a bit go ahead. That too. what oh i was just saying i think illusion of uh happiness was going along those lines as well it all really starts coming together to me. It just blows my mind when you start reading some of this stuff and rubbing it together, like to, you know, then this flame comes up. And especially yeah, Ivy, let me just suggest this and then we can do what you wanted to talk about. But you remember when I said, you're just panicked and you keep trying to, you know, do stuff and you forget that you can stand back and ask for help. Remember? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then remember when I said, I understand this, Ivy, you know, and you probably, I mean, I know that you honestly, your, your situation is worse in degree, but that the mental state of mind where Oh my God, now this, now this. And I also had little kids to take care of. And so I'm really panicked, right? Um, and that whatever else you might have been through, um, this stuff is about that too. I think actually I've decided that after living in Batesville, it took maybe a dozen years or so, I started getting mild PTSD because I didn't, I couldn't bond with people there. And I'd been ripped away from my family. So I wasn't bonding with anybody. And I didn't have a secure place to be. And I just, part of my brain was just not functioning. Um, so anyway, um, we'll start with your comments. And then uh, I hope that you can connect this to what we've done so far because it's all connected. Like with Alicia, the mind over matter thing goes back to Augustine's version of Christianity, Kant's version of reason, right? And this tendency in our culture to be dualistic and repressive, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, just act on principle, right? And then the other extreme was those materialists who just did their data points. And that's what ends up with that diagnose, diagnostic manual that he says only focuses on the behavior and not on the real cause. And the real cause is not genetics, it's environment and it's specifically bonding it's like bonding is what makes us human and that's what you can't study 
when you're studying behavior, you're not studying relationships. And that comes right from utilitarianism. Do you all understand this? It's like, and it's important to know that because it means this has been embedded in our culture for centuries and it's embedded in our brains and it's unnatural. And so if you have trouble having integrity, <laughs> Don't blame yourself, that's number one, right? You were born into a culture that set you up for having trouble with integrity, okay? So it's a setup. <laughs> and then we have to piece it back together and figure out where we went wrong. Just this guy is saying, well, gee, we need to have art. We need to have play, we need to have theater, it's like, Hey, that's what the Greek said. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard of Robert Ellis? I don't think so. He's one of the, well, he is the founder of rational emotive behavior therapy, but he said something about how, um, actually I'll just read it because I knew that you would appreciate it. Uh, I don't know, maybe I won't read it. Okay, I mean, you something, can- Something about how the Greeks had it all figured out. They had it all set up. And then we go back and as we look and dig through the pieces of our culture, we see that the ancients had it all. Oh, doesn't yeah. that drive you nuts? Yeah. But then he gets to get this huge reputation that he invented a new thing. Right. <laughs> here, here, Dr. Beck is like screaming and shouting and trying to teach us stuff and ending up at the bottom of the rung in the philosophy profession because philosophy doesn't respect it. Right. Ah! <laughs> okay, you guys, it's not trauma. It's just damn frustration. But... <laughs> <laughs> But there was a point when I'm trying to take care of little kids, of course, and the system is completely knocking me out that it was trauma, right? So anyway, so let's start, let's see. Since I talked to Alicia a little bit before you came on, Ivy, why don't we start with you and like what you wanted to bring up, whatever from the readings, you start where you wanted to start. Are you there? Sorry, my mind went. I just said. I think she's trying to decide what she wanted to. Yeah, okay. Well, that's all right. Warren is not going to come. Okay. Um, uh, basically, talking about how our bodies need the reinsur a reinsurance. I don't know if you heard what I said, Alicia, or if you heard the last of it. Um, but basically, I was saying that it related to what you was talking about, about how, what is it, mind over matter, even if I'm re-saying it, it's hard to say, <laughs> but um, about how we've been trained to think mind over matter, but it's it takes more than that to keep going. It's like we're getting it, but it takes more cultivation, I guess, um, and so... And as uh, my comments on what you were saying before, Dr. Beck, after you told me that I'm thinking harder than I have to, I started realizing even in like little decisions, I do fall to the harder decision first instead of like thinking of an easier solution. And like even words, I struggle to say like the simple words, but the harder words I get easy and I'm like why am I that way is it like something that is beyond me and in the reading they were talking about how we tend to blame ourselves for a lot of things and I feel like wow I do do that is that also something that's beyond me like I'm struck um what is it cultivated to think it's my fault so that I'd seek help and I noticed like I 
do struggle to connect with people that I um, live in a van and I feel like that has not helped me at all because like my first year of Lion I tried so hard to integrate and it didn't work and then it's been a slow decline like decline from there and I feel like I've said I need some kind of connection and for me it's animals you know um, they said that in the article little children they um, don't know who they would connect to but they do connect to animals and I feel like that's one of the most basic ways of saying we need some kind of connection um and that's also one of the reasons why i believe religion works because if you don't have if you can't find like companionship you think well there's something else that loves me you know something other than myself um so and even though i'm like i need an emotional support animal or something people are people keep telling me I need a therapist, you know, they keep telling me, go see, go talk to someone. I'm like, why do I have to do that? You know, am I making sense? Yeah. (laughs) Do you, did you read the part where he said you really need to know who you want to trust as a therapist? I mean, I think you're thinking that, first of all, there's nothing wrong with me. It's society that's the problem. Yeah, I understand that. Um, For a long, 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 long time, I never thought about blaming anybody but myself. It wasn't Mm -hmm. until actually this semester that it really dawned on me. I was talking with Dr. Beck in our other class that I'm not what's wrong. You know, the system is broken and I am trying to figure out how to keep it from breaking me. How to work correctly in a system that doesn't work correctly. So the fact that you can see that even if you do have your own issues, it's not just you, you know, it's Mm -hmm. everything, it's everyone. And you develop a a trigger, right? Yeah. You start to be self-protective because safety, right? You've lost a sense of security and safety. I think actually, Ivy, what's another thing becoming pretty popular are women's circles. But again, all the women in the circles have to be stable enough that they wouldn't hurt each other. But if you get that women really talking to women and supporting each other and saying, yeah, I've been through that. So, So Ivy, I just want you to know that the three of us have been through a lot that's very similar. We're just at different ages at this point, right? But I was like, it brought me back to when you also said that everything's connected. And I've like read in so many places that everyone goes through the same struggle. And I never thought, why does everyone go through the same struggle? Maybe the system really is designed for us to somehow go through a struggle in our life. You know, like it'll be hard, but we have to over, you know, we all understand if that makes sense well how much of it is socially constructed and how much of it is natural okay um for example on the religion thing and this would be what's the difference between what you would call an aristotelian humanist kind of christianity and a fascist kind of christianity right and so there are these like augustine if you're born told sex is dirty and naughty and baddie bad and everything to do with the body is sensuous and evil and you have to turn away from it right if that's your religion you're going to be traumatized and if also your parents think kids are born wanting to do bad and they punish you and you get to the point where you don't have a safe zone and you're not bonded well fine, you can go to God, like God loves you and whatever, you're resorting to it. But what if you go to church and the preacher is there committing all these very violations where it's not going to make you more secure? The preacher just reiterates you can't trust other people and everybody's just got a, everybody's a worm and everybody's dirt and you just have to keep depending on God 
and incidentally, your preacher, you have to totally blindly believe him because, you know, and so, so on the one hand, do you remember I had that article with Augustine that this little girl got traumatized by her religion, right? Does everybody yeah. understand it can be really bad? <laughs> but on the other hand, it can be really good right it when it's tied with humanism and aristotle and cultivating our capacities and knowing the only way we can cultivate them is through relationships so when the article on the body keeps the score says we are by nature social beings that's aristotle right it, and is that what robert miller or whatever ellis was saying that it's the social stuff that's really affecting our brain chemistry and determines what sort of which genes turn on and which don't and whether we get traumatized or not yeah he's saying it isn't necessarily the events that happen to us but it's the way that we have been conditioned to think about them it's the way that, it's the way that we the beliefs that we have about them and in this one article that I was reading, um, he's talking about two different types of religiosity, the absolute people and, uh, let's see, the sinners in the hands of an angry God view or people who embrace the model of a loving God. Definitely. Okay. And both Christians say me and my sister, okay, raised the same, both uh, Baptists, both worship the same God, but if she is looking at God as an angry God and everything that happens to her is a punishment handed down from God, that affects the mental health in a negative way. Of course. Whereas having a loving God model is more beneficial to somebody's mental health. Um, the whole thing is about, you know, because what I'm interested in is, you know, not just healing the body, but healing the mind and the soul. And, you know, it all has to be, factored in and so how do you reach people who don't follow a religion or believe in any thing greater than themselves so using the stoic philosophy is a really good way to kind of get in there but that's what the article was about so, so yeah Ellis, Ellis was in favor of stoicism yeah yeah I'll just say why I prefer the Greek because the Stoics, ultimately, it's tranquility of mind. Yeah. And they lived during an empire. And they didn't. But I mean, Americans are groupies. Like, we have so much opportunity to get engaged in public life. You know, even if it makes our lives more complex, we yeah. can be involved. We can be a lot more proactive than if you live in an empire. And so that's why I prefer the Greeks, that the goal is to maintain level-headedness within a context of taking on a whole lot of roles and having different kinds of friends and just be engaged with with public so you're I mean it just seems to me a, a higher level of evolution to be able to do that and the society you live in is more involved evolved and the fact that the Romans came after the Greeks is we can devolve. And I think we are devolving. Yeah. And I, I worry that a lot of philosophers know that we are about to elect a dictator. We're about to vote out our democracy. And all they're going to do is go stoic, right? <laughs> Instead of getting out there and talking like Socrates and getting yourself killed. So... <laughs> So, but I think most of the students don't think of it that way. Like Alicia, yeah. you're not going to, you know, live like a stoic, right? Because yeah. you're, you're not going to be an intellectual. And maybe you try to tell the emperor off a little bit. and You try to teach the future leaders. Most students who get it are going to have to aim for tranquility within a context where they are actually more engaged. Right, um, which is 
why a couple of weeks ago when I said, you know, the Stoics got it wrong. It's oh, because, yeah. okay. It's because you can't just, oh, how was I going to say it? You can't just do what is practical. You cannot just be good because that's what's expected of you, because that is what you're supposed to do. There has to be a driving force behind it. And I, I haven't read all that I need to read. I haven't studied about it enough, but it seems like just straight stoicism kind of removes that inner force that has to go along with why you choose the self motivation yeah yeah but well actually stoicism changed also yeah um when the empire was less corrupt uh they were more engaged and then it, as it got more corrupt they became more removed and they started to say, just stay sane, you know, yeah. just don't go nuts alone. Uh, but in theory, the, and again, I don't, again, we don't, who cares? Who cares, right? Why do we have to read all these privileged white guys anyway? I mean, and make distinguishes between them. Like the main idea is that you need to live as complete a life as you can. Right. And in theory, the tranquility of mind one, he actually says you have to balance public and private. You have to figure out at any point in time what, what is your best contribution. So for example, Alicia, I can see you going into counseling and you're anticipating one-on-one -on -one with women. And all of a sudden you realize that the counseling center hey where people are coming is not being run very well. <laughs> and you'll end up running it, you know, and you'll end up having to have meetings with all the counselors so that they don't, so that they get along with each other. And I mean, yeah. I, so can you see that, Alicia? That yeah, I can, I can see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, Thank you yeah. so much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> I mean, you can start wondering why do people go into counseling because <laughs> they needed it. So I mean, that's where, you know, that on the one hand, I would say everybody in the world would need a really good counselor. But on the other hand, if you can become your own really good counselor, you're probably a little better off because it, it, you're not going to find somebody who will say exactly the right thing or whatever. But um, I, I get what I get what you're getting at, Ivy, and Alicia does too. But that's why, that's why that we need therapists and we need counseling. But maybe I need to find it myself rather than listen to you know what someone else says because even then they're kind of just guessing for themselves too for my problems. If you understand that, well, he did say <laughs> you should get to know a person before you decide, right? You should ask them, well, what is their philosophy? And um, maybe you can ask them, like, why did you go into it, right? Um, and I think any good therapist would be honest. Um, and I, I've gone to them at various times, uh, but I, I knew exactly what I wanted from them. And I was in charge and they were grateful for that, right? <laughs> Uh, because at one point, the only people I was talking to was extended family, and there was no outside voice that could give you any perspective. And so just somebody to give you perspective was what I needed. And I had six free sessions, right? Okay, it's free. What the heck? <laughs> so on the third one, the, the woman told me, well, you already know most of the stuff that I get paid to try and help people understand. And I said to her, that's okay, because here's what I want to get to a number. I had a whole chart, right? This is point A to point B six different times. So Ivy, so do you understand, Ivy, that going to a therapist can mean so many different things? And it can, it's just too ambiguous. <laughs> With me, 
I didn't go to a therapist for myself until I was like 38. And as opposed to running into somebody younger than me, you know, just out of diapers, telling me all about life, you know, because I was like, what are they going to tell me that I don't already know that I haven't already figured out? And it, she didn't really tell me anything. She asked questions nice. about what I thought or how I thought or what do you do in this type of situation? And she really helped me to kind of think about my own thoughts as opposed to telling me how to feel or what to think. So I think you're right. It's, it's crucial to find the right counselor um, and no, you don't have to have a counselor or a therapist, but why it would, that's why it was helpful for me because she helped me step back and think about how I was doing things and how I was thinking things. And well, is that working for you? Well, no. Well, then why are you still doing it? What else could you do? That kind of thing. So, yeah, that was, the, I didn't go till I was 50. Yeah. It was absolutely too desperate. Yeah, it's like I don't I cannot do that reflective thing or I won't be able to, I won't have the energy to do what I absolutely have to do to survive. Exactly. If I if I take time to think about it, I will fall apart. And then I'll have to put the energy into putting the pieces back together. I and know. it was I don't have the time to go to more appointments. I don't have the time to sit there and talk. It's like there's not enough time. I can't do this. So, right. I mean, I even went to one once and, and she said, how long before you get tenure? I mean, she just knew this is something. You got to get tenure, right? I mean, you can't, you're not going to be able to do anything. So Ivy, I hope this helps a little bit because I think both of us can understand something about the panic, but also you're young and there's just, stuff you know it it might not be a good time for you or whatever but the best ones are the ones that just listen to you and you hear yourself talking and you realize oh my god right <laughs> is that right alicia yeah it's well because i wasn't really conscious of how i viewed myself how i thought about myself what okay what is my self-esteem Okay, and so I would do these little worksheets and I'd be like, okay, well, I must think that I'm a piece of crap. <laughs> but I mean, that's how I treated myself, you know? And whether it was because I simply just didn't take time for myself because I was too busy taking care of others or because I internalized what other people said about me, we didn't deal with that. Why do you think this way about yourself? We dealt with, okay, what do you think you're worth? You know, what do you deserve better than this? Okay, then go change this. What Do one little thing. Celebrate any small victory. You know, you got a good grade on your test. Go buy yourself a $6 coffee that you would normally not buy. Anything like that. Just to appreciate yourself. So yeah. there was not, it wasn't any type of psychoanalysis or trying to blame parents or friends or upbringing or anything like that. It was a solution as opposed to digging out the roots of the problem because you can do that on your own. I mean, you can do the whole thing on your own, but you don't have to do it alone. So, so I'll tell you though, that the reason for this class is that those classics will give you what every American experiences consciously or not, no matter what their specific situation is, right? This tendency to think in dualistic ways or this tendency to think in reductionist just behavior, right? And then that that's wrong. And so, and the guy we read for today said it's so prevalent in the psych, so, Look at the way psychology has been corrupted, right? It's been abused by, for torture techniques, for corporate advertising techniques, 
for military um, justification, you know, appeal to fear, appeal to fear of the other, more police, more military. I mean, it's all those techniques have been uh, completely corrupted to, to end up with people who are psychologically in exactly the wrong place. But the profession itself doesn't distinguish and it allows a whole lot of lousy stuff to come in. And then in addition, it tends toward that kind of reductionism that the body keeps the score guy says is completely wrong because we're social beings. And then on the other hand, that kind of dualism, which makes us hate ourselves. So, I think you need to read, right, Aristotle, that traditional humanism, and then you need to read Stoicism, that it has the same virtues, but it's in a context of more, less engagement. And then you read Augustine, where he splits things, right, in the name of God. And then you read Thomas Aquinas, who tries to bring humanism into Christianity. And then you read Locke, remember rights. I have a right, it's individualism. That's what Locke brought in, individualism. Obviously we're having terrific problems because we're not rugged individualists. We don't just pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. You know, Our children are not our property. <laughs> and then that was a blank slate. Like we're gonna be able to rewire human beings and Locke's view of public life is it's rational to calculate your own economic self-interest. So we have a whole economic system based on this heartless, cruel, but it's supposed to be rational. And then so many people now are suffering just economically because the money stuck to money, which Locke didn't want to have money because he knew this would happen. But this is the world we live in. So we've got these individualists, you're breaking off your ability to make connections. And then you've got this rights language, you know? So mommies are competing with the fetuses for their rights. Like I have a right. I was just like totally screwed up, right? It's just completely not human. The baby has a right to life. No, I have a right. I was like, come on. This is about pregnancy. <laughs> that's how far removed. But I mean, that's why it, it drives people nuts psychologically, because it's so unhealthy. And then you have that dualism of Kant. Just ignore all your emotions, except obedience to the moral law. And that makes for terrible political stuff. The principle of abortion. Right. Well, do you want the principle of abortion or do you want actually fewer abortions, like real abortions, a real procedure? <laughs> and that's how split we are. Right. We're just willing to live in this incredibly disembodied world, part of us. Right. Or the culture keeps beating that. And then on the other side, people are just looking at behavior and they're trying to poke and prod like a herd animal and they don't just talk to people like and this is the new therapy is actually to have these huge interviews with people about well what about your relationships <laughs> so this is some brand new thing and so you know the new thing is that actually people are formed by their relationships and then i can tell you look at the books we've read that have led exactly to that point because the that manual is definitely a utilitarian based behavior based and then we have this corruption which mr hedges talks about and so christian fascism makes it completely makes sense given the way the culture keeps subconsciously molding people in these ways where God is either a fascist dictator <laughs> or God is somebody who loves you and, you and you're not accountable. Like once saved, always saved. So on Saturday night, I can go drinking and whoring and then I go on Sunday 
and ask for forgiveness and it's all good with God. Like you can trick God. <laughs> okay. Do people understand that? Can you understand? How yes. That? Okay, good. I, because I, I talk a lot, but my job is to help people understand what's going unconsciously. That's what you read philosophy for. And then you, each of you has your own personal life and your own personal story. And those stories are important. But if you have a therapist that has, he said, some kind of ideology, there's a certain one size fits all. You don't want that therapist. They'll do more harm than good. Right? Does that make sense? Um, yes. Okay. So does somebody want to make, okay, Ivy, do you have any other comments you want to add? No, I'm good. Uh, what about you, Alicia? Uh, I mean, not necessarily. I need to read more of the body keeps the score stuff. So I'm hoping we can talk more about it on Friday. Yeah, and there's um, there's more than one body keeps the score. So right. we have one, we had one for today and we have one for um, Friday. Friday and one for Monday. Okay. Um, but let me just point out a couple things. Um, let's go to the, the fascism. Oh, do I have an outline? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So there's the corruption of psychology, the corruption of happiness studies, right? right. The corruption of the view of happiness is straight shot utilitarianism, yeah. right? It's what happens, really happens when it's Bentham's view of utility. Like nobody can tell me about higher and lower pleasures, <laughs> right? Okay, so then you end up with this literal reading of the Bible is very authoritarian. Now look, in the name of God, children experience trauma. That's what I was getting at. Is Ivy there? We lost her. Anyway, did we? Uh, do you understand how this is? Mr. Van der Kolk would say the religion is part of the trauma. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Religion and is. That's, that's kind of how I was tying into what I had been reading in my research is having a, an angry God is kind of it's harmful <laughs> yeah. you know well yeah. and, and then he does start out with how he was taught right yeah that you're supposed to be um self-critical you know um aware of our conflicted motives right know yourself um uh, save us from despair i mean again you can take or leave it, but it's much deeper, obviously, than authoritarian religion. And yeah. then the fact that you cherry pick, um, the Bible says a lot of things. And then that acts of compassion are always subversive to totalitarianism because either on the left and the right, they don't emphasize compassion, right? right. And, um, okay, so, Ameri yeah, dominionism is really bad, that we're different. And so we can appear to be evil, but we're not really, oh, right? That, that's really bad stuff. And that, that would be the mentality of the people who traumatize these people who Mr. Van der Kolk, you know, end up in his office. Yeah. Right? Um, a kind of colonization. Okay, so this is where people cannot have their own story. And that's where therapy helps you have your own story. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I can see people who have had this type of experience with God. And I mean, they can't, like, they couldn't go list things off of this outline and say this right. is what happened but they're so angry 
at God and or in or religion in general or people they're angry at others because they believe in God. I mean, it's very very deep, right? And I just it got tied to survival instinct as a child. Yeah. Either they got traumatized, and so whenever you talk about God, it's going to trigger them in a negative way and they're going to get defensive and you know not want to relate to anybody yeah. or they god was your justification for protecting yourself against the enemies right and so all of a sudden anybody who's not church of christ is like a real threat uh -huh. right oh my god it's so unhealthy and well, it is the opposite it made me, it made me think also of uh Okay, back when we were talking about education and church being separated, how, you know, the, the people came over and they founded their new America and they were supposed to be for religious freedom, but then they wanted to control how that freedom was used. And well, yeah, you're free to believe whatever you want to believe, but you can only use this Bible and you can only use this type of school lesson and you can only use this interpretation. That's that's not freedom, you know, that's still. And I, I forgot where I was. I, I had a point, but I lost it. So okay. <laughs> but really, if you just keep remembering 85 of the people who signed the declaration were Church of England. Right. That was humanist. But that had gotten corrupted into the aristocratic class. But it was humanist. But why do we have the nutcakes? Because they were not, they were discriminated against in England, right? Yeah. Because they were nutcakes. But they came to America. <laughs> so that's why our founders said, you can have that mentality of church. But you have to have a totally different mentality. I mean, they knew you may not bring that into polit politics or we're not going to have a democracy, right? right. We're going to lose it. And so that's why education was so important. And that's why these small liberal arts colleges are so important. And that's why I'm so grateful I got to spend my career teaching in one because even if the students, I don't know how many of them get it. But I knew it's important, right? This ability to be fair to opposing points of view, this ability, and and it and that it is related to survival. But we cannot survive by dividing, right, Mr. Vanderkoop? We're wired for cooperation. Yeah. And what's happening is religion is being used as a weapon to divide. And so then we won't be able to take care of our problems. And so some authoritarian guy will, or woman, yeah, it's women too these days, will um, take over and we will become mindless idiots or we'll kill the best people. We'll kill the people who stand up to them like, like Jesus was killed and Socrates was killed. And it, it's really scary, Alicia. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Too much sense. Too much sense. Okay, but then when you combine that with what Mr. Vander, I was just, I'm reading this and I'm saying, it's like I paid him to say this. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. I mean, it's satisfying to have my job, but it's really frustrating. I've been trying to tell people this for 40 years. Oh, well. Yep. We'll see you tomorrow, uh, Thursday at 8 p.m., right? Yes. I have to. Thursday, I'm glad you reminded me because I would have logged on and then I would have been like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's it, uh, it'll be interesting with the Title IX and the sexual, you know, improprieties. I can yeah. tie that in with what we're doing. Everything connects. So. Yeah, well, I have to redo mine also. I watched the video in time, but I didn't answer the questions in time. So I've got to go back and answer answer the questions but what questions oh title nine there's title yeah nine. Oh. yeah because i missed the deadline last friday <laughs> well, well deadline for what the students all had a deadline of friday by like 5 p.m 
or something and I was working on a paper and so I logged on at like I don't know 10 30 or 11 or whatever and I could still watch the video training but you have to go through and do a little test and get a certain number right or you have to re-watch re the video all the students were required to do it so it is it something like a scenario and then is this sexual assault yeah it's um uh, well i mean like it wasn't a guest lecture and stuff like we had when i first came in but it's trying to incorporate uh gender issues into it which even three years ago weren't as big of a deal as they are now so is it sexual orientation issues or is it gender issues um identification issues like pronouns and oh uh yeah yeah i had a student who self-identified they and them and i've i'm really tempted to do that um because when i write i've given up he slash she and i just use they and them uh -huh. um or I've all over and over, I try to change it from a singular to a plural so that I don't, yeah. But anyway. Yeah, there's a student in pragmatism who identifies as they and them. Um, is that Ace? Yeah. Well, she changes her name too. So yeah. <laughs> she's kind of cool. Yeah. And she always takes these gen generic names. You can't tell from the name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that reminds me a long time ago, there